Hello and welcome to the second part of our webinars on the upcoming historic presidential elections in Venezuela, in which President Maduro is seeking a third term. This pair of webinars, and we had the first one last uh, Sunday, is organized by the International Manifesto Group and the Orinoco Tribune. The International Manifesto Group, uh, as some of you may very well know, discusses the fast-changing political and geopolitical economy of our world with members from around the world and has issued a manifesto titled Through Pl Pluripolarity to Socialism. It can be found at www.internationalmanifesto.org where you can read it, sign it in various languages and also volunteer and donate. The Orinoco Tribune, our co-sponsor, is an independent news outlet created in 2018 to provide accurate news and analysis from an anti-imperialist perspective on news and developments in Venezuela and the world by creating as well as curating multimedia content from Spanish and English sources. This pair of webinars is also co-sponsored by the Alliance for Global Justice, by Venezuela Solidarity Campaign UK, by Geopolitical Economy Report, by the Louis Real Bolivarian Circle, by the Fire This Time for Social Justice, and by the Venezuela Solidarity Network in the United States. My name is Radhika Desai, and I'm the convener of the International Manifesto Group, as well as the moderator for this second of these two very important events. For an allegedly authoritarian state, Venezuela goes to the polls astonishingly often, holding municipal, regional, and national elections, as well as referenda, on average about once a year since the foundation of the Bolivarian Republic. And, and it does so in electoral processes that while they are attacked, as unfair and non-transparent by the Western media, have been praised by many critical outlets as the gold standard for free and fair electoral processes. So now that Venezuela is holding presidential elections and appears poised to re-elect President Maduro, the Western media are working overtime, producing the usual litany of lies about Venezuela. They claim that Venezuela's economic woes are caused by the government and not by the nearly thousand sanctions imposed upon the country. And we must remember that until the uh, uh, until uh, uh, the Kremlin's uh, uh, February 2022 uh, uh, special military operations in the Ukraine uh, or in Ukraine, sorry. Um, Venezuela was the most sanctioned country in the world. And it remains, you know, uh, in terms of the proportion of the economy, you know, the proportion of sanctions to the size of the economy, the most sanctioned country today. The Western media also claim that people are leaving Venezuela because of Venezuela's socialist practices rather than the U United States' profoundly murderous sanctions. They claim that Ms. Machado, the banned opposition leader, who is nevertheless running her own horse in the race, is very popular when, in fact, President Maduro is leading the polls and attracting hundreds of thousands to his rallies. Uh, the Western media repeats Ma uh, 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 Corina Machado's claim that her candidate is going to win unless there is massive fraud. And, and the Western media, by repeating this, is cooperating <clears throat> her attempt to delegitimize her Ill, imminent defeat in advance, much as what Trump tried to do earlier in Washington. The Western media claims that the uh, United States and the West is in, interested in Venezuelan democracy, when in fact they are merely interested in Venezuela's resources. The list of lies is so long that, quite frankly, uh, to list them all would be to take up unnecessary time. And it's time that we had better spent listening to the truths 
instead. Last Sunday, as the first of this pair of webinars, we had four speakers, and now we are going to listen to the next four. So without uh, much ado, let me uh, let me uh, for introduce the first of our speakers, Diego Siquera. Diego is a journalist, writer, translator, editor, and political analyst. He's based in Caracas and is a founding member of Mission Verdad, where he currently writes about geopolitics, global conflict, and Latin American and Venezuelan history and politics. So Diego, please go ahead, the floor is yours. And just, uh, sorry, I should have said this earlier, all the speakers will have 15 minutes each. And at the end of that, we will go to about half an hour of questions and answers from the floor. So Diego, please go ahead. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you all for this wonderful webinar, This wonderful program and also very thankful to keep Venezuela on the map because I think it's of course we're not in the front line now we're not the frontier of con global conflicts or struggle against empire but nevertheless we're still there and we're still holding the line especially in a very strange moment in our country and the region in general so Thank you very much. Happy to see many known people, also friends. I must say that I'm talking through my phone, so I sometimes I don't, I'm not able to see the chat or reply, but I've seen some greetings there, so greetings to all. Anyway, I'll go, I'll just jump into our current subject. I decided that the proper thing, and I, and I guess it also that's why it's organized this way, I decided to like give us, at least from my perspective, a, a view from the ground in the sense of how things are being lived right now and how are being perceived and what's our relationship in general to this uh, pre-electoral environment so far. So the first thing, that's the first thing we have to talk about and it's quite interesting. We can find some very strong differences of previous uh, electoral moments and of course it has to do with the social and economic context because so and also something else which i will further elaborate uh, this is the first time we don't have like a highly festive highly insanely mobilized overwhelming uh climate it's actually rather pretty low-key if you can contrast it to any of the previous ones, including the Ezequibo one, who was our last, who uh, that was our latest electoral moment. This has to do with many things that are, of course, related. Firstly, to the sanctioned regime we've gone through, to the practically decade we've also survived of many sorts and styles and templates of and rationales of global of, of conflict, hybrid warfare, if you will. I'm not going to develop the concept this time. Don't think it's necessary either. I think it's a staple word now. But um, we have to say for firstly that Venezuela prevailed. The U.S. lost in an in a let's call it a, a asymmetrical equation. They didn't uh, reach their own goals, aims, or objectives. They were the superpower. They were the ones who declared what they were going to do, and they failed. So that first headline, I think it's very important to never lose from sight. But secondly, there's something else. One thing, it's a war environment, <clears throat> complex post-modern war, whatever, and a post-war environment is quite a different thing. And as we are also discovering the same way we did with the previous experience, we are in some sort of post-war moment that we don't feel now the immediate effects of sanctions. We don't feel the immediate, more superficial wounds of sanctions of uh, Guarimbas. I think all of you know what, what Guarimbas are, but anyway, all these color revolution coded uh, unconventional war warfare tactics they used to accelerate conflict and to force a regime change delivered by Venezuela properly instead of the US because it's cheaper. So we're now at a stage that many things are quite frankly under control, even by even 
even more than he during the Comandante Chavez years. And I'm talking specifically about two things. I'm talking about economy, domestic economy in this case, but also media uh, environment. Also, it's, I mean, quite different. This has to do about, uh, for many reasons, but one of them I would like to, to, to expose, to show you, it's basically the new consensus that currently exists, which are highly pragmatical and uh, highly functional too. And I think also they're highly uh, beneficial, regardless of, of course, uh, what to desire of expect that things should be. I'm talking about how, for example, we have reached the lowest number in inflation, how uh, our problem, it's not, a, it's not a shortage of goods, or access, it's basically something that has a lot to do with the global dynamic, which is the value of our currency, hence the value of salary. And of course, something else that we have to also address, which is a series of distortions of phenomena, of, of, yeah, even social malaise, if you want, uh, that are actually completely related to the current context, and uh, especially if the government has relied on a quite interesting strategy that work very close to the private sector, a private sector that historically has been part of the engines of conspiracy, but currently they realize how much they've lost with sanctions. I think this is an important element also because it kind of changes the, the, the equation of resistance, call it that way. Of course, it also brings another series of contradictions that for a Venezuelan that has seen all this going on, I think they are just not that important still there's a major and there's a there's a, there are two major effects of this moment that i think we have to take into consideration first of it it's political erosion i think as in political involvement from the majorities and uh, people are really tired of conflict but they are really tired also of politics itself as a general thing. I'm not saying about Chavista politics. I'm not saying opposition politics. I'm saying, I, I'm saying politics in general. And this has a direct effect. It, it is a direct effect from sanctions. Uh, people are jaded. People, we also have terrible uh, communications uh, outcomes from every side. And that also, I mean, that doesn't help what people love to call the narrative right now. But I think it's also not that important. Still, I think it, uh, this all talks about this deeper layer of wounds, of scars of, of, from our survival of this 10 year misadventure. Uh, and that doesn't mean that people are not aware. I mean, this, this is still a highly political conscience population, uh, but with these kind of catches, I mean, uh, this kind of uh, emotional, woes that we because things have certainly improved very much but we're not right there we're not we're not that that close to shore yet and um we also saw uh even moments that we were even closer i mean the venezuela se arregló meme was one of those but they lasted not too long the other thing is that i think this is also quite obvious but you have to mind that one of these explanations has to do with the Tocqueville effect, the Tocqueville paradox, if you will. You see, things have improved, but as they improve more than the previous stages, the demand of improval in general actually intensifies. So also frustration intensifies too. So we're they probably in that moment, I think, basically because people are able to demand even more or ask for or, or expect more from in economic improval, social stability, political moment, uh, daily life, which was the central battle of all each and all Venezuelans. So in that sense, that kind of explains a bit how things are. And that also explains the niche that Maria Corina Machado is trying to exploit right now uh, through his Proxy crash test dummy candidate, uh, poor little Edmundo Gonzalez Urrutia, former diplomat, a very third tier, third rate uh, 
a diplomat with no actual political participation before. It's, so that kind of resembles the Guaido moment. But even he's even further away of the limelight than Guaido was before he became suddenly president. But of course, it tells you a lot of things about uh, how the correlation of forces is actually operating. I mean, it's funny how Radhika, her introduction, basically said it how it is. I mean, we're the main competition is between Nicolás Maduro and Maria Corina Machado, but we have the the particular situation that Maria Corina it's not formally or legally a presidential candidate. Uh, that would be his proxy, which is I. It's pretty cynical if you if you think for a moment because we're talking about an old man, uh, a non charismatic old man, a tired one, an in, in, inexperienced in politics politic wise. That it's actually not a threat to Maria Corina. I could think about at least uh, a dozen other po possible uh, formula compañeros or compañeras here that could have even be more effective electorally speaking. But of course, they would become a threat because they actually demonstrate, regardless of how they do, they do have a mind of their own. And there's another thing, which is also a particular element of context here, which is another consensus, another national consensus that regard that's related to actually the opposition itself. We usually address them as the opposition, since plural, because that's actually the case. There are uh, other nine candidates which most of them also share another thing, at least at some level. They consider, and regardless of how hypocritical they could be, they consider sanctions a real problem, an unfair problem, and uh, an excessive problem, and that that's not gonna solve anything that in the, actually from their point of view, thwart is any possibility of uh, actually doing politics because they always, because this is a pattern that hasn't changed, it always, uh, grinds down to this as one person that's going to have the like the full backing of the many uh, psychotic schizophrenic uh, versions of the U.S. of U.S. empire in this case in power circles in economic circles in political circles. No one, not ne never one interlocutor. We're talking about several all the times. So we're not talking to one person. So we don't know who we're talking about when we talk about it, but sometimes, of course, you have like the basic guy that asked is the president of the U.S. or is someone representing some some circle of some circle of capital interest in Venezuela. The other thing about the elections is you're going to have because of things are just how they are. It's going to be a pretty systemic vote one more time, but with a particular element also. Uh, this also it has a particularity, which is, I think it's more global than local, which is this extreme social engineering, step by step, block by, by block, street by street, that the media battle has become. And I'm being quite ironical about it because I think it has been quite shady from every side, but anyway. Uh, but, the, but it doesn't uh, rule out the hysterical ways of electioneering that's going on here. And I know it's not a Venezuelan thing. Actually, like many other things, Venezuela has finally globalized in the, in the, not in the good sense of the word. And this is another symptom of this. So that's also it's quite particular to how you, the usual uh, Venezuelan electoral spirit is. The other thing, which of course I'm gonna uh, rely on our other friends on the panel to talk about, but they, I still can't, take them out of them. It's, for example, how geopolitical this this is. It has always been. There has always been a heavily uh, relationship, interdependence with the geopolitical RRII uh, uh, aspect, of course. But this time, of course, for obvious reasons that I need don't need to elaborate either, it, it, it's, it's very present in a very strong way. And also with a, what with a twist, a very important one, of course, which is our, these paradigms that are currently the paradigms, civilizational, if you will, paradigms of the moment. And think about, of course, the two basic, more uh, resounding junctures uh, globally, which of course are Gaza and Ukraine. And actually in how all these uh, candidates, including ours, relate to this kind of uh, to this kind of things, because we're talking about now a moment 
there is no more a discussion about if you support or don't support genocide and make a political model out of genocide in order that if you're able to cope and, and accept what's going on in Gaza and the way that it's going on, it's going to be able to work somewhere else afterwards. The Gaza model, like some commentator wrote back in a few days ago, a very smart one. I'm talking about Tariq Siri Lamar in this case. Uh, and at the same time, yeah, it kind of seems Manichaean to, to establish it this way, but it is. Regardless if, if it's my Manichaean, we're talking about life, death, we're talking about good, bad, we're talking about in a very basic dichotomy of things, if you reduce it to these complexities, which is also a very strange contradiction to say, but it's I think it also has to do with that. The other thing, and probably I could finish here in order to take advantage of time. It's, well, what are the things that are emerging from this? We are usually accustomed to walk towards darkness in a open sense. I'm not talking in the moral sense or philosophical one. I'm just talking about the unknown. And Venezuela has always had like the uh, fatalistical <laughs> sense of just to have to go in go through there and i think that is going to be the case once we're over once the hysteric of the campaign are over i mean think about for example the polls and how aggressive and this has also been you can find like uh, any uh, the one you prefer to follow but probably most of them are just wrong as it has happened in the past uh, besides two or three agencies but this tells you also about what kind of things with all this in mind is going to be what's going to emerge afterwards i for one think that it's going to be a another chavista victory i don't think it's going to be a a, a big difference one i'm always when they ask me what do i think about what's coming next i'm always say i'm more concerned about july the 29th that i am from july the 28th for several reasons so uh, which are also quite obvious, I think, and are also, I mean, we're also pretty much aware of what, what they are. So, but it also demands an inner question, even from how people outside of Venezuela and inside of Venezuela approach what's going to be the Bolivarian Revolution's next stage after a quarter of a century. Uh, and I might say, call out first that many fetishes, I could say, or many desires that we are usually, that are usually part of a Weltanschauung could be a bit compromised this time, but that doesn't mean that the meanings that are gonna emerge after another failed regime change attempt, uh, among several regime change attempt, uh, failed attempts globally, which are, it's creating this void, this vacuum it's gonna give. So uh, finally, I don't think we're the only ones that are gonna walk into the dark after July 28th. Thank you very much. Everyone. Thank you so much, Diego. That was uh, really a wonderful introduction to what Venezuela and uh, her democratic processes are up against. So thank you very much. Now we move to our second speaker, Steve Elner. Steve is uh, currently a um, uh, Associate Managing Editor of Latin America Perspectives. He's retired uh, professor at the Universidad de Oriente in Venezuela, where he taught economic history and political science from 1977 to 2003. Among uh, his more than a dozen books on Latin America uh, and Latin American politics and history is his soon to be released edited collection, Latin America's Pink Tide, Breakthroughs and Shortcomings, Roman and Littlefield. He has published on the op-ed pages of many uh, 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 outlets, including the New York Times and the Los Angeles Times. So Steve, please take it away. Thank you, Radhika, Jesus, Alan, and the others who have made this these two webinars possible. And for this invitation to talk about the, the upcoming elections, uh, and to counter the distortions and the, the half-truths of the mainstream media. Actually, the, the term half-truth itself is misleading in, in that uh, many times half-truth refers to 10 percent 
truth and 90% false. And I think that's what's happened in the case of Venezuela with regard to the corporate media reporting on, on, on these upcoming elections. I, I, I would like to look at the wider implications of um, July 28th. Um, uh, what it means not only for Venezuela, but also the region and, and, and the world, and two issues in particular. Uh, and, and that is the rise of the far right and the issue of imperialism, US imperialism in particular. The issue of the rise of the far right and what uh, many call fascism or neo-fascism uh, is the central focus of discussion about elections here, here in the United States. Um, and the case of recent, ele uh, recent elections in France, in Holland, Germany, throughout Europe in general. Um, th these two contexts, the context of the rise of the far left, uh, the far right, excuse me, and the rise of imperialism, the, the role of US imperialism, um, is also the source of much debate on the left. Uh, for instance, some on the left argue that Trump is not a fascist because fascism only emerges in reaction to a strong left, which in the case of the United States isn't the case, unfortunately. Um, and there are people on the left, specifically theor th uh, theoretical uh, analysts on the left, who deny that imperialism should be the central focus of any analysis of what's happening in the world. Um, and they reject the idea of prioritizing the struggle against US imperialism. In the case of Venezuela, both factors are at play uh, and have to be emphasized in any discussion. That is the issue of the rise of the far left, uh, for the far right, and the issue of US imperialism. And needless to say, the mainstream media doesn't even remotely discuss uh, either one of these two issues. But one thing is for the corporate media to skirt the issue of the far right uh, and the issue of US imperialism. Another is for sectors on the, on the left uh, to do that, which I believe is, in the case, is the case um, of those people on the left who fail to make any distinction at all uh, between Maduro and the, and the right wing opposition, fail to bring in the issue of, of US imperialism into the picture. This is the case, in my opinion, with the Partido Comunista de Venezuela, the P PCV. Let's take a look at both of these issues with regard to Venezuela. Maria Corina Michal represents not just the right, but the far right, uh, as it has emerged throughout the world. One of the characteristics of the far right is its expression of hatred for the left. That is to say that, um, well, the more moderate right, the center as well as centrists, don't reject the, 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 the uh, the left in no uncertain term. The, uh, other sectors are not friends of the left, but it's the far right that preaches hatred for the left. It's the far right that associates the left with drug trafficking, uh, terrorism, um, and that's the case of Maria Corina Machado. That's what she has done over a period of, of, uh, of many, many years, specifically in reference to the Maduro government time and time again. Um, but also in reference to the Foro de, pa de Sao Paulo, which takes in leftist movements throughout Latin America. Um, another expression of hatred for the, for the Chavistas is her brandishing of the slogan, no to impunity. And on that basis, she talks about wanting to see President Maduro behind bars. The other sectors of the opposition, which I call the center right, uh, Manuel Rosales, who was the candidate um, for the opposition before he dropped out, and Capriles, Enrique Capriles as well, and even Henry Ramos of Acción Democrática. These people previously adhered to similar positions, but those people, after so many fiascos on the part of the opposition, they, they modified their position after the opposition lost control of the National Assembly in the year 2020. So the Rosaleses and the Capriles and others began to oppose the US imposed sanctions. Um, Machado didn't. She didn't change her position after 2020. Rosales and Capriles began to call for a negotiated solution 
with the Chavistas, which implied a degree of toleration. Machado didn't do that. Another characteristic of the far right is its support for shock treatment style neoliberalism and mass privatization. That's exactly what Machado's position is. Uh, she sees mass privatization is the key to economic recovery. Not that the center right doesn't support neoliberalism, they do. But the position on neoliberalism is somewhat ambiguous. They refrain from taking a firm position. For instance, the candidacy of Rosales um, was supported by Fuerza Vecinal, which explicitly opposed the privatization of the oil industry, which Machado supports. Um, and Capriles has stated that oil belongs to the Venezuelan people, whatever that means. Um, but that statement by, by Capriles earned him the criticism of Machado supporters. A third characteristic of the far right is its support for uh, uh, and participating, participation in internationalism, which is currently being uh, constructed. Bonds are being created between far right movements and plans are being made to create a new international of the far right. Uh, Marine Le Pen's activism in Europe, she recently met with uh, Arben of, of, of Hungary. The Spanish party Vox, their recent summit in which Javier uh, Malay was the star, as was uh, Le Pen. Uh, and Steve Bannon's travels throughout the world in favor of uh, the European far right uh, and in favor of Bolsonaro of Brazil. All these are, are tendencies. And Maria Corina Machado is well placed in this network with ties with Netanyahu of Israel, uh, Santiago Abascal of the, the Vox party in Spain. Uh, her fervent support for Malay in the elections of Argentina and her condemnation of the Peronistas. Uh, all that fits the pattern of this internationalism of the far right. So that, that's the first dimension um, that I believe is at stake in the upcoming elections, which the media isn't touching with a 10-foot pole. The second topic, uh, which is central to understanding what is happening um, on July 28th, uh, and which the media, true to form, has ignored, is the issue of imperialism. Unfortunately, sectors of the left also play down the topic. Francisco Palmieri, who's the de facto U.S. ambassador to Venezuela stationed in, in Bogota, has declared that the U.S. supports Machado on the basis of the fact that she won the opposition's primaries held in October. But there were other options for Washington. Rosales, for instance, didn't participate in those primaries. Um, so why did the United States, why did the, the State Department cast him aside Furthermore, once it was clear that the Venezuelan state would not allow Machado to run under any circumstances, the U.S. backed Machado, Machado's right to choose who that candidate was going to be. That is to say that Washington is not only supporting the opposition per se, it's backing the far right within the Venezuelan opposition, as it did previously with Leopoldo Lopez, beginning with the Guarimba uh, that Diego made reference to uh, the, the first but in 2014. Uh, and as the State Department did in the case of Guaido, uh, those two leaders, Leopoldo Lopez and Guaido, belong to the far right party, Voluntad Popular, and that party supported Machado's candidacy in the primaries that were held in October of last year. July 28th has to be seen, has to be seen in the context of a candidate that is Maduro, who has resisted the actions of U.S. interventionism, who's pronounced, who, which, the, the most pronounced expression of U.S. interventionism is the system of sanctions, but it includes many, many other things as well, which the webinar last week and the other speakers today will enter into detail on. In contrast, Machado makes no effort to, to hide her pro-U.S. sympathies, which she states explicitly. There is no way to deny the fact that these elections pit an anti-imperialist candidate against a pro-imperialist one. 
Yet sectors on the left, in effect, deny that this is the central issue of the elections. The PCV, which I mentioned before, the Communist Party of Venezuela, places Maduro in the same category as the opposition on the basis of his alleged neoliberal economic policies, which I will not go into. There's no time for it, unless during the Q&A uh, session there's interest uh, uh, for me to do that. Uh, but there's a contradiction here with regard to the Communist Party. If you read the PCV statements justifying their support for Enrique Marquez, it has nothing to do with economic policy because Marquez himself cannot be described as anti-neoliberal. Over the last two decade, uh, decades, Mar Marquez was not particularly well known in Venezuela, but Marquez uh, has been closely associated with Manuel Rosales and his Un Nuevo Tiempo party. This is a tendency in Venezuelan politics similar to social democrats throughout the world. Uh, elsewhere, they maintained, in some cases, fairly progressive economic policies up until the 80s and 90s, when they tended to support a moderate uh, version of neoliberalism. Not the radical neoliberalism of Machado, but nevertheless, uh, neoliberalism, which one might describe as selective privatization, which was the case of Rosales when he was the mayor of, of Maracaibo. So basically, the PCV is raising the, raising the banner of democracy and forgetting about anti-imperialism, at least when it comes to its analysis of the Maduro government. The, the PCV may call itself anti-imperialist, and in fact it is, but nowhere do they deal with the relationship between imperialism and the Maduro, Maduro government. If they did, they wouldn't be able to voice their all-out condemnation of the Maduro government. So just to wind up, I guess I've, I'm, you know, uh, uh, I have just a minute or two left. So I just summarize by saying that sectors of the left accuse Maduro and those who support him of adhering to what is often pejoratively referred to as campism. Campism goes back to the first Cold War when the left the leftists allegedly had to choose between the Soviet Union, which adhered to socialism but was anti-democratic, and the United States, which adhered to democracy but was pro-capitalist. The Green Party, their presidential candidate in 2020, Howard Hawkins, Howie Hawkins, used the term campism and in doing so condemned the Maduro government. Fortunately, the current Green Party candidate, Jill Stein, takes an entirely different position. But the problem with campism um, is that it frames the issue um, that ignores several key uh, aspects. One is that the United States is, 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 might be democratic, uh, but there's no question that it, uh, for, that it provides support for dictatorships throughout the world. It did during Cold War I, and it's doing that today. I won't go into details on that. Uh, but the second point is that, and, and I'll, I'll end with this statement, that there is a natural convergence between the position of the Chavez and Maduro government and multipolarity and Russia and China, whose foreign policy discourse and their actions specifically with regard to Venezuela and Latin America emphasizes the defense of national sovereignty. Um, again, I don't have time to go into the details, but the lines are clearly drawn with regard to international relations. The candidate of the far right is unabashedly in the US camp with his principle of R2P, responsible to responsibility to protect, which is a cover for interventionism. On the other side, you have a government which has received support from Russia and China but one based on the principle of defense of national sovereignty. That doesn't mean that Venezuela is in the camp of those nations, but rather that there is a convergence with regard to the basic principle of national sovereignty. And this manifests itself in both political and economic spheres. The latter being the importance that the Maduro government is giving Venezuela uh, interest in becoming a member of BRICS, an organization which China and Russia or founding members of. Okay, my time is up. Thank you. Yeah. I don't hear you. Yeah,
trying to unmute, but she's having a problem with her. Okay. I just have some, am I irritating uh, uh, alarm going off? Uh, okay, there it, there it is. Okay, sorry. Um, yes, thank you so much, uh, uh, Steve. That was really great. Uh, and, and a fantastic analysis of the confrontation between imperialism and what's going on in Venezuela. Thank you so much. Uh, next speaker. Oh, and I should add that I see that some people are already putting questions in the chat. So please feel free to do that. I will be collating those questions at the uh, end and for the question and answer session. And uh, since we are a relatively small group, we can also you can also put questions by raising hands uh, 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 in the question and answer session. Okay. So let me go on and introduce our third speaker, who is Benjamin Norton. Ben is hardly needs any introduction. He is the founder and editor of the independent news website, Geopolitical Economy Report, where he does original reporting in both English and Spanish. He has reported from numerous countries, including Venezuela, Nicaragua, Bolivia, Ecuador, Honduras, Colombia, and many others. His journalistic work has been published in dozens of media outlets, and he has done interviews on a very wide range of international news outlets. And he always gives a great speech. So Ben, please go ahead. Thank you for the much too generous introduction, Radhika. Um, can everyone see me and hear me? Great, um, it's, a, it's a pleasure being here. I wanna thank uh, Jesus also for organizing this very important um, con digital conference. Um, and I think actually my remarks, they flow very well from Diego um, and also from Steve. I think it, you know, it's a logical sense because today I'll be speaking about Venezuela and geopolitics, v Venezuela's very valiant role in challenging US-led imperialism. And in order to do that, um, I, I actually presented a, a short presentation. I created a short presentation. So I'm going to try to, can I share my screen? It's saying that, uh, it's saying that it's disabled. Yes, uh, Linda, you could you please make Ben co-host and then he will be able to share. Yeah, no problem. Mostly okay. just because I, I have some be. charts and it's always better to show charts than talk sure. about them. Okay, can everyone see this? Okay. Today, I'll be discussing Venezuela's very important role in helping to build a multipolar world. This is very important because this is a term that we've heard more and more in the past few years. Even recently, the foreign policy chief of the European Union, Josep Borrell, has acknowledged that Western dominance is over, and he has acknowledged that we're in an increasingly multipolar world. You'll see mainstream corporate media outlets like The Economist, The Financial Times acknowledge that we're in a multipolar world. But Venezuela has played a very important role in this. When we talk about multipolarity, it's not simply the rise of China, the reemergence of Russia, other you know, powers like Iran, Brazil, India, but also Venezuela has played a very significant role. And the Bolivarian Revolution has, has been very significant in this process. And Hugo Chavez himself was extremely prescient. And in 1998, when Chavez was still campaigning for, for the presidential election, he gave a speech in the Palacio de las Academias on the 12th of August. And he famously said, quote, the world of the 20th century that already appears on the horizon will not be bipolar nor unipolar, thank God, it will be multipolar. Now, I really want to emphasize how prescient and incredible this was. In 1998, this is the peak of U.S. unipolarity with the overthrow of the Soviet Union in 1991, then the Gulf War leading up to the invasion of Iraq, the U.S. government's declaration of full-spectrum dominance, the Wolfowitz Doctrine, and you, a year before Chavez made this speech, uh, Brzezinski published his famous book, The Grand Chessboard, in which he talked about the strategy by which the U.S. would try to maintain this unipolar order to prevent the emergence of any powers that could challenge U.S. hegemony. So the fact that 
that Chavez could see this so early is a testament to how brilliant he was in his vision, not only for Venezuela, not only for Latin America as a regional bloc, but for the world. Now that, that quote is well known. What is not as well known is the larger context. So in this speech that we have a, a transcript of, I posted the link at the source here, I translated the larger context of the quote. And after saying that it's clear that the 21st century, um, I'm sorry, I just noticed that I have, an, uh, uh, I have a typo in this presentation. He said the world of the 21st century. That's a major typo, sorry. The world of the 21st century that is on the horizon. But furthermore, he continues saying in this quote that there is obviously a North American poll he noted that there was a European poll that had emerged with the European Union. At this time, many people still thought that Europe might be a more independent poll. Although, of course, we've seen that in the past 20 years, the EU has been completely subordinated to the United States, which has only gotten worse with the proxy war in Ukraine. He Chavez acknowledged an Asian poll. He also said, very importantly, China is rising. And he could see this very clearly. This is before China joined the World Trade Organization in 2001 and saw incredible world historic double digit GDP growth. But still, he could see very clearly that China was rising. He talked about the Asian tigers, which had gone through the 1997 Asian financial crisis, but he noted that they still made effort to lift themselves up. But what's very important is Chavez also said, look, Latin America must be an important poll in this multipolar world. With great effort, he said, we have an obligation as well as the need to propel the formation in the medium term of a true world power in this part of the world, in this part of the American continent. And he noted that Venezuela could be a hinge, at not only in South America, but linking Central America to South America, linking the Caribbean to Latin America. And of course, the fact that he could see the rise of China in the 1990s is very important. Of course, this is probably the most important geopolitical development of the 21st century is the economic rise of China, overtaking the United States as the world's largest economy, according to IMF data in 2017. Today, China, when its GDP is measured at purchasing power parity, represents 19% of world GDP. And that's actually probably an understatement because of the way China measures GDP, it actually emphasizes manufacturing production and downplays services, whereas a huge part of US GDP is fictitious capital in the financial sector. The US also does computed GDP using, for instance, owner-occupied housing. So what you would charge if you were renting your house and that's computed into GDP. So the point is, is if you look at the chart on the right, you can see, that China has become the world's largest manufacturing power by far, representing 35% of global gross production in manufacturing. So the fact that Chavez could see this, I mean, again, is a testament to how much of a visionary he was. And Chavez took his first trip to China in 1999, his first year of his presidency. And this was also important because it marked the 50th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. It also marked the 25th anniversary of Venezuela, Venezuela's relations with China. And this year, 2024, they just celebrated their 50th anniversary and had an event that I attended in, in Beijing. Furthermore, in a speech that Chavez gave when he visited a, a Peking University in 1999, he said, quote, we have begun to produce an autonomous world politics independent of any center of power. And in that, we are also like China. So emphasizing this increasingly increasing multipolarity back in the 1990s. Now, Chavez visited China more than any other leader in Latin America and the Caribbean in multiple times throughout his terms. And in 2001, he met with Jiang Zemin and they declared a strategic partnership for common development. And that has very much continued and strengthened under President Nicolás Maduro and in 2023, Maduro visited China and signed 31 comprehensive agreements, including they formally upgraded their relations to what China refers to as an all-weather strategic partnership, which is one of the highest designations at the level of Pakistan. Very important for China-Russia, China-Venezuela relations. Now, 
if this is a chart that looks at the number of agreements signed between China and Venezuela a, as of 2017, so this could very much be updated with with scores of more, well over 500. But as uh, between 1974 and 1998, before the Bolivarian Revolution, before Chavez de Maduro, Venezuela and China only had to sign 20 agreements. From 1999 to 2017, in just 18 years, they signed 472 agreements. This really emphasizes how important this friendship is. And this is a chart that shows trade between Venezuela and China which is so important because as I'll be talking about with sanctions, China being the world's largest economy has been an economic lifeline that has allowed Venezuela to pers pursue an alternative path, trying to build socialism, challenging neoliberalism and US led imperialism. And if you look in the, in the 1990s, trade was basically zero. In the 2000s, there was trade, but it was pretty negligible. And it started increasing in the late 2000s and exploded in the 2010s, especially under President Maduro. And what's interesting about this chart is you can see that actually Venezuela has enjoyed a trade surplus with China. Of course, most of that is oil exports, but that's still important because of course, China has a massive current account surplus and it has a massive trade surplus with many countries, but with Venezuela and also with Brazil, it actually has a trade deficit. And this is extremely important because the U.S. has tried to crush Venezuela through sanctions and a blockade. And this chart on the left, you can see that Venezuela's oil production, it's not a coincidence, it collapsed, first of all, when the U.S. pressured Saudi Arabia in the 2010s to collapse international oil prices. This is before Saudi Arabia was pursuing a more independent, non-aligned policy. And John Kerry took a trip to Riyadh and made an agreement in which the U.S. provided more and more support to the extremist far-right forces, the Contras in Syria, an attempt to overthrow the Syrian government. And in return, Saudi Arabia massively overproduced oil, which collapsed the price of oil in the international market, which also was an attempt to crush not only Venezuela, but also Iran, to try to pressure Iran to go to the negotiating table of the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal. And of course, it was an attempt to punish Russia after the US backed coup in Ukraine in 2014 and the annexation of Crimea, which had historically been part of Russia and was only given as basically a formality when Ukraine and Russia were part of the Soviet Union. And the US was trying to, to suffocate Russia's economy with the imposition of sanctions and then furthermore with the collapse of oil prices. Following that, the Obama administration declared Venezuela to be a so-called extraordinary and unusual threat to the national security of the United States. And that led to capital flight. It led to international investors refusing to invest in Venezuela because of fear of US sanctions, which followed many rounds of aggressive sanctions that started under Obama and accelerated under Trump and have continued under Biden. And you can see it's not a coincidence that oil production in Venezuela collapsed and in fact, the U.S. Energy Information Administration boasts of this on its website, noting that Venezuelan oil production fell to its lowest levels in 2019 at the peak of the U.S.-led coup attempt, the lowest level since 2003 when the U.S. orchestrated the coup that briefly su succeeded just two days in Venezuela in April 2002. And then there was an oil lockout, a boss's fake uh, strike led by pro-imperialist elements in the in PDVSA, the oil company. So Venezuela is, is in some ways part of this global trend. This actually, this map should be updated. This map shows how China has become the largest trading partner of a plurality of countries on earth. Actually, it's, it recently became a majority of countries on earth. And Venezuela has also, its largest trading partner is, is now China. This should be updated. But the point is that Venezuela has been part of a global trend, but it has been at the vanguard of this trend. Along with, with Latin America as a whole, you can see that in the, the early 2000s, trade with China was still very, very low, but it has absolutely exploded to such an extent that now China is the largest trading partner of Latin America as a whole, if you exclude Mexico. Now, President Maduro has applied officially for Venezuela to join BRICS, and Maduro said that BRICS represents the potential, quote, new world order without hegemony 
without empires, without colonialism of free and independent countries. And BRICS, of course, although there are internal contradictions, it represents an economic alternative to US-led imperialism. And BRICS, the BRICS economy is largely because of China, but also to a lesser extent because of India and Russia, which have seen very large economic growth in recent years. The BRICS countries have overtaken the G7 as the largest economic bloc when their GDP is measured at purchasing power parity. And again, if you look at GDP, you're not talking about what kind of economic production is happening in the economy, goods and services. If you also look at things like production of major commodities, if you look at wheat, oil, gas, iron ore, and manufacturing production capabilities, BRICS is certainly significantly more important than the G7. Another way in which Venezuela, and in particular Chavez, but also Maduro, have been extremely, extremely prescient is in not only discussions of de-dollarization, but attempts to try to create tangible alternatives to the US dollar system. And as far back as 2007, and actually even before, Chavez had talked about the importance of challenging the dollar. But in 2007, he made the concrete proposal for the creation of the Sucre. And this actually happened in 2009 with the creation of the Sucre, the unified system for regional compensation. And that was created in 2009 and from 2010 into 2016, it was used for over a billion dollars worth of trade. And it was mostly with Ecuador and then with the basically internal coup after Rafael Correa left power in 2017. And you had the rise of Lenin Moreno, who basically, you know, he was a traitor who did a kind of internal coup. And then you subsequently had right-wing pro-imperialist governments that led to the death of the Sucre. But this is very important because today we've seen, for instance, Lula da Silva in Brazil has really talked once again about the importance of challenging U.S. dollar hegemony. He's called for creating a Latin American currency. And of course, Brazil is the B in BRICS. He took a trip to China in 2023 and went to the New Development Bank, which is currently headed by former Brazilian President Dilma Rousseff, and talked about the importance of, of creating alternatives to the dollar. This is, of course, very important and very welcome, but this is well over a decade after Venezuela played a lead role in actually creating a Latin American currency. And because of the series of coups in the region, the rise of right-wing governments, that we did see the unfortunate death of the Sucre in the short term, but I do think that in the long term, the medium to the long term, Chavez and Maduro and the Bolivarian Revolution will be shown to be extremely visionary. Now, of course, the, the institution that helped to oversee the creation of the Sucre was the Bolivarian Alliance for the Peoples of Our Americas. And as is often forgotten, it's not just the ALBA, but also the TCP, which stands for the People's Trade Treaty. So the idea is to create an alternative to neoliberal free trade fundamentalism, which in reality is not free trade, it's freedom for foreign investors. The vast majority of so-called free trade agreements, they're not so concerned about tr free trade, they're concerned about making sure that foreign capital concentrated in the US on Wall Street, the, in City of London, that they have so-called the freedom of investment with no capital control so they can move very speculative capital flows and hot money in and out of the country without any limitations. But the Alba TCP has always been an alternative for what a regional trade block could look like. And of course, this is why the US has targeted the Alba and has pressured every government in the region to withdraw from and sabotage Alba. And the photo on the left showing Alba in the first iteration under back when Chavez was, was still in power before his, his death in 2013. You can see that almost all of the leaders in this photo were targeted by US coups. So in the case of on the, the right of the photo, you can see Manuel Zelaya, the, the elected president of Honduras, who was overthrown in a US backed right wing military coup in 2009. You can see to the right of him to our left is Evo Morales, the president of Bolivia, who was overthrown in a U.S.-backed coup in 2019. You can see, of course, Chavez, who was a victim of a U.S.-backed coup in 2002, and many constant, never-ending coup attempts subsequently. And then, of course, you have Daniel Ortega, 
the Sandinista leader, the president of Nicaragua, and he was targeted in a very violent coup attempt that failed in 2018. And of course, there was the Contra death squads in the 1980s. So it's not a coincidence that the U.S. has targeted all of these leaders for overthrow. And after Rafael Correa left power in Ecuador in 2017, the internal coup happened and Ecuador withdrew from the ALBA. And after the 2009 coup against Celaya and Honduras, on the right-wing coup regime also withdrew from ALBA. And after the US-backed coup against uh, Evo in Bolivia in 2019, Bolivia also withdrew from ALBA. We can see a very clear trend here. So the US has seen this, US-led imperialism has seen the ALBA as one of the most significant threats to imperialism in the region and to US economic hegemony. And then of course, we all know, I don't need to speak about I mentioned the 2002 coup that was backed by the, the George Bush administration. And then, of course, in 2019, the coup attempt with Juan Guaido that the U.S. government played a key role in. We all know about this. And, you know, there has been a lot of attention. I'm wrapping up, by the way. There has been a lot of attention to Venezuela's oil. And it, it certainly is true. I'm not saying this is not a factor. Venezuela has the world's largest oil reserves. And Trump himself said in a Republican Party rally in 2023, when I left, Venezuela was ready to collapse. We would have taken it over. We would have gotten all that oil would have been right next door. This quote got some attention, especially the oil element. But in reality, I think actually what he said is even crazier than we're going to take Venezuela's oil. He said, we would have taken over Venezuela. He didn't say we'll take over the oil. He said we would have taken over the country. And this, of course, is, has continued under the Democrats, under Biden. It started under, under Obama. This is very much bipartisan. And there has been attention to comments made by, for instance, Laura Richardson, the commander of U.S. Southern Command under Biden. She said in 2023, she talked about all of the lithium and the lithium triangle of Argentina, Bolivia, and Chile, the world's largest oil reserves, not only in Venezuela, but also Guyana, which is increasingly becoming a kind of U.S. protectorate. The U.S. is using Guyana to try to destabilize Venezuela. There are reports that it's it's going to build a military base in Guyana. The, they're attempting to seize Venezuelan territory. She mentioned Venezuela's resources, oil, copper, gold. She mentioned that, that China gets imports a lot of food from the region. The Amazon, of course, fresh water, which clim with, with climate change is becoming more and more important. But... I think it's very simplistic to say simply that the U.S. is desperate to overthrow Venezuela's government because of oil, because of resources. It is a factor. I'm not disputing that. John Bolton, the national security advisor under Trump, acknowledged that U.S. oil companies wanted to get access to Venezuelan oil after Chavez had kicked them out and nationalized the oil industry. It's certainly a factor. But of course, the U.S. is also the world's largest oil producer. The U.S. doesn't need Venezuela's oil. U.S. companies would like it. The U.S. would like to get access to other resources in Venezuela. But in reality, I think, you know, the main driving factor is fundamentally it is political. Of course, economics and politics are inextricably tied. There's no difference between them. But in the sense that Venezuela has been, as I've been talking about here for this presentation, it has been at the vanguard of challenging US-led imperialism and creating a new multipolar order. And John Bolton himself acknowledged this. Of course, he was Trump's national security advisor. He was the architect of the coup attempt in 2019, which he boasted about in an interview on CNN. And in his memoir, Bolton said that Venezuela is a direct challenge to the colonialist Monroe Doctrine and he said that we must resurrect the Monroe Doctrine. I put the term return in scare quotes because in reality, the Monroe Doctrine never really went away. You know, it's 201 he, years old. It never went me. away. Yeah. And I'm concluding. It never went away. But in particular, we can see that in the past few years, multiple U.S. government officials have invoked the Monroe Doctrine. And in his memoir, Bolton in particular spoke of Venezuela as a threat to the Monroe Doctrine, in particular because of its relations with Russia, China, and Iran. So I really think it just, it's very important to emphasize 
not only how much of a visionary Hugo Chavez was, but also how President Maduro has continued Venezuela's multipolar construction and has not only maintained an independent foreign policy, but an activist foreign policy in trying to build an, a multipolar world that is not simply a dictatorship of US-led imperialism, because that's really, you know, the, the unipolar era was an international dictatorship led by US imperialism. And the US talks about so-called democracy as if it were a democracy, which it very much is not. But in reality, you cannot talk about democracy when a small handful of imperialist countries that were the colonizing powers that colonized the majority of the world, their goal is to control the entire world, the entire political system and the entire economy. That is an international dictatorship. And in that sense, Venezuela has been at the vanguard of trying to build an actual international democracy, which we can call multipolarity, through from the beginning, before Chavez even came to power, we can see in 1998, through his terms until 2013, Maduro has very much continued with this. And the Bolivarian Revolution, I think, represents one of the most important revolutions in modern history, in that it showed that even a, a relatively small country compared to big powers like China and Russia, even a relatively smaller country like Venezuela can be at the vanguard of helping to build a true international democratic order. On that note, I'm gonna conclude. Thanks a lot for having me today. Thank you so much, Ben. That was such an information packed and I think analytically excellent um, presentation. And I just also wanted to add that, um, you know, Ben has quite rightly emphasize the extent to which uh, Hugo Chavez was so prescient in seeing that the world was about to become multipolar even before the 20th century ended. Uh, but I would like to add one other element in uh, uh, another aspect in which he was exceed exceedingly um, prescient, which is that he um, coined the term pluripolar, which was distinctive to his discourse and um, uh, what, by that he meant that, you know, the world economy was acquiring many multiple poles of concentrations of productive power, which was essentially undermining the strength of imperialism. But these concentrations of productive power were not the same. So, you know, the Chinese economy is not the same as the American economy, and even the American economy is not the same as the uh, as the West European or, or Japanese economy. They're all quite different. And that's why he coined the term pluripolarity. And this is the term that we have um, used, uh, the International Manifesto Group has used in the, not only in its manifesto, but in the title of its manifesto, um, through pluripolarity towards socialism. And so for us, it's a profoundly significant theoretical innovation of Hugo Chavez coming from uh, this, uh, as Ben rightly emphasized, the ability of this relatively small country to punch above its weight in the international sphere, not only in economic terms, but also in ideological terms, in theoretical terms. So I just want to emphasize that further. So now we go to our final speaker, Alan McLeod. Um, and uh, let me just introduce Alan. Um, Alan McLeod is a member of the Glasgow University Media Group, and he's a senior staff writer for Mint Press News. He completed a PhD in 2017, and since then he has already published two books, uh, one called Bad News from Venezuela, 20 Years of Fake News, and another called Misreporting and Propaganda in the Information Age, Still Manufacturing Consent. He's also, of course, written many academic articles, and he has contributed to FAIR.org, The Guardian, Salon, Grey Zone, Jacobin, and Common Dreams. So, Alan, please go ahead. You have about 15 minutes. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I do uh, apologize for contributing to The Guardian. Uh, thanks. It's an honor for uh, me to speak with uh, you today, especially with such fine speakers like Diego, Steve and Ben beforehand. As you said, I'm a journalist at Mint Press News. I cover 
US imperialism as really my bread and butter, but in a previous life, I did a PhD about the media's coverage of Venezuela and in Latin American studies more generally. And out of that came the book Bad News from Venezuela, 20 Years of Fake News and Misreporting. And so, as we've heard here earlier, Venezuela is indeed hosting presidential elections on July 28th. There are 10 individuals vying for the position, including nine in opposition to incumbent President Nicolas Maduro, who heads a coalition of 15, uh, 13 leftist groups. However, Maduro isn't just fighting against nine other candidates. He's also fighting against an intense campaign from Western corporate media who are really desperate to either unseat him through the electoral process or undermine or taint his victory as fraudulent. Venezuelans uh, often used to talk a lot about uh, una guerra mediática inside their own country, but the media war from outside is just as real. It does seem, as, um, as uh, Diego and Steve were talking about, uh, that Washington, everyone there from pundits to politicians alike, have coalesced around the 74-year-old retired diplomat Edmundo González and anointed them as their... Uh, their um their candidate du jour and the coverage of gonzalez in western media has been glowing to put it mildly so cnn for example describes him as a wildly popular and quiet bird-loving grandfather full of quote poise and calm and they talk about how people see him as a quote grandfather of the nation kind of figure who could usher in a new era uh, after the political violence of the last decade end quote of course, they don't talk about who is doing that political violence or anything like that, but we'll leave that aside. And of course, other corporate media, all with incredible access to Gonzalez suddenly, have done the same. They all mention that he was a career diplomat who retired in 2002, but not one that I've seen has mentioned the reason why he retired in 2002, which was he was forced out after he enthusiastically backed the coup against uh, Hugo Chavez, which installed Pedro Carmona, a very Trumpian figure, a business leader, as dictator. And as we heard before previously, uh, Gonzalez really, while he's been presented as, as an independent, he is really very much uh, taking so many of his lines from the extreme right, from Maria Corina Machado especially. And from what I've seen, Western media can't really decide whether Gonzalez is going to romp home to victory or be squeezed out. So the Wall Street Journal, for example, reported that he has a lead of 20 points in the polls. Uh, but the New York Times recently just wrote that his hopes of actually winning are slim to slight. Why is this? Well, this follows a very well-established pattern for corporate media covering Venezuelan elections which is to build up whatever opposition candidate they prefer as an unstoppable freight train rolling towards success, but poisoning also, poisoning the well beforehand, claiming that if he does lose, it can only be because um, a patently fraudulent election process has uh, stopped them from, from achieving power. And this is because it is anathema to corporate media uh, to admit that there is a support base for socialism inside Venezuela precisely because they spent decades either pretending these people simply don't exist or demonizing them whenever they can. And media coverage of these elections has really fallen into very much the same tropes as we've seen time and time again throughout the, the last couple of decades. The main one being that there is a courageous opposition fighting against a despotic strongman. In fact, you really could just change around the names of the protagonists and just run stories from 2018, 2013 or earlier. So, you know, for example, in 2013, the media presented a far right figure, Leopoldo Lopez, as a courageous left leaning moderate. And in one very infamous uh, Newsweek article, even described him as having twinkling chocolate covered eyes. Uh, sorry, twinkling chocolate colored eyes and high cheekbones. The article was called Leopoldo Lopez gives Venezuela the image of a revolutionary who has it all. Um, the media this time, certainly in previous, uh, certainly in the, 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 the few previous years, has really given up any semblance of balance and it has been openly and blatantly calling for military action um, against Venezuela. And I'll show you a few of those examples uh, right now. 
So hopefully you can see my screen now. Uh, the New York Times printed this one. Venezuela is a disaster. Time for a coup? Question mark. Uh, the Washington Post, the odds of a military coup in Venezuela are going up, but sometimes coups can lead to democracy. Uh, should the United States attack Venezuela, wrote the New York Times. Sorry, I refuse to pay for uh, the New York Times, so you're going to have to see that paywall uh, advert there. Um, again, Venezuela's path to democracy, pay off the military, wrote the Times in 2019. Foreign policy was perhaps even more blatant. It's time for a coup in Venezuela, ran their headline. And um, one last one from the Globe Post. Venezuela's Maduro will go. It's just a matter of time. And of course, when those coups uh, were tried and were failed, um, the media had to come up with some sort of explanation for it. And they went with this in the Washington Post. Is what's happening in Venezuela attempted coup? First, define coup. So they basically just said, actually, there was no coup after calling for one for years and years. Since it didn't uh, come out the way they wanted, they said, actually, this wasn't a coup. So I think probably for this audience, though, it's more interesting to talk about why this is happening rather than just keep running through more and more examples of biased framing, because we've probably all seen them before. Uh, as part of my research for my PhD and my book, I actually interviewed a good number of journalists who produce most of the English language content on Venezuela for Western audiences. And what I got from talking with them was that they're actually a very small group of individuals and they see themselves as really the intellectual shock troops of democracy fighting against authoritarianism in the form of Chavez or Maduro. So one, for example, the New York Times, Anatoly Krimenaev, he described himself to me as a, quote, mercenary for hire, end quote, and openly bragged about how he deliberately inserted fake or wildly exaggerated news into the public sphere. He described this as uh, practicing, quote, what he said were sexy tricks. And he even gave me one example. There was a story a while back that condoms in Venezuela cost $750. This was completely untrue, as uh, the ninth paragraph of the story did actually uh, make clear. But if you just read the headline, as most people do, and the first few uh, paragraphs, you would have come up with a very different conclusion. Actually, the truth was that a whole box of condoms in Venezuela cost $8, which was about the same as in the UK or the US at the time. But how is that going to generate a story and generate hate towards a government? It's simply not. And so foreign journalists working for establishment media overwhelmingly see themselves as um, sometimes having to bend the truth in order to get their desired outcome, which is regime change. And they were very open about this uh, to me. They live in, overwhelmingly, they live in a small bubble of privilege in penthouses in Altamira in Eastern Caracas, and they go to garden parties at the weekend. They live for the most part in gated communities with armed guards and they rarely, if ever, venture out into the more popular areas. And even if they did, a good proportion of Western journalists inside Venezuela can't actually even speak Spanish. So they can't realistically interact with the bottom 90 plus percent of the population. And so to them, it seems that everybody hates the government because everyone in their circles does. And that includes all the people in the newsroom which I found were really hotbeds of opposition support and activism. Almost all Western sources do employ local Venezuelan journalists, but not from places like the Orinoco Tribune. Uh, much more likely they're coming from places like El Nacional or El Universal. These are legacy outlets who played a crucial role in the 2002 coup against Chavez. And those who do not, <clears throat> those who do not conform to this sort of Chavez are our Chavistas are the source of all our problems. Uh, that narrative I pushed out. So I did speak to one LA Times uh, journalist who covered Venezuela, and he said that in the newsroom, there was a clear sense that this guy, he meant Chavez, was a threat to democracy. And we really need to be taking uh, these opponents' uh, sides and getting that perspective out there, he said. And his colleague, he, saw, he, he was told, said that we have to get rid of the government. I also spoke to one Financial Times journalist who did not uh, share the same sort of opinion on the matter. And he told me, uh, he said, quote, I just never even pitched stories that I knew would never get in. 
What you read in my book would just never in any form get into the Financial Times. And I knew that, and I wasn't stupid enough to waste my time pitching it. I knew it wouldn't even be considered. After I got knocked back from pitching articles, I just stopped. It was complete self-censorship." End quote. So <clears throat> ultimately, why is this happening? The short answer is that in a capitalist system, media are the agents of the capitalist class, and they want uh, to see the end of any attempts uh, to build socialism inside Venezuela. And because it's refused to toe the line, Venezuela has been the target for uh, the US empire for more than two decades now. The US has spent vast sums of money and resources attempting to achieve regime change there. This has included funding NGOs, opposition parties, social movements. It's included unilateral coercive measures that have taken the lives of tens of thousands of people and uh, forced millions more to uh, leave. We've seen attempted coup d'etats and more. But little of this would be at all palatable to the American public if the country was not so demonized first in our media. And that's the real crucial role that has been so important to the US empire. That's what the media play. Media constitutes an important front in the battlefield for Venezuela, softening up the public for regime change. And so I'll finish just by reminding you that before they send in the tanks, they always send in the journalists. Thank you so much, uh, Alan. That was a really, really a great takedown of the media coverage. And uh, we really appreciate it. Now uh, we are about to move to the question and answer session. And uh, I would just, uh, I think I'll begin by posing some of the questions that have come up in the chat already. But if you want to pose questions, please go ahead and uh, use the raise hand function, which on my screen appears under the reactions tab at the bottom of my um, uh, Zoom uh, window. Uh, so if you want to ask questions, please uh, raise hands. But in the meantime, let me go ahead and raise questions. So uh, let me pose a couple of questions to begin with. One is from Saheli. It's a question for actually specifically for Diego. Um, just a second. Okay, yes. Uh, so the question is, do you think the new national popular consultations about communal projects will politicize more people, reduce the jadedness and make them more involved? And a second question, and I'm sorry, I forgot to include the name of the person who asked this. But the second question is, what is the revolutionary Chavista government doing to secure Venezuelan in secure the Venezuelan information space from soft war weapons? And a third question comes from Katerina. And uh, it is, is it fair to see the success of the Venezuelan government in stabilizing the economy? thus creating a low bourgeois, bourgeois uh, white collar section of the population, more susceptible to propaganda, a potential problem. That's what happened in Europe in the 1950s. So I have these three questions. One of them is directly for Diego, but uh, I think all the speakers should feel free to uh, uh, respond to uh, all of them. So, uh, but let me begin with Diego and then I'll go to the others. Can I also just ask a question of the chat very quickly? I'll throw a question to them. Uh, I should touch would be in Venezuela in a couple of weeks for the election. What sort of coverage, what sort of uh, questions would people like to see? Uh, what sort of coverage would people like to see uh, coming out of Venezuela in the next few weeks? Great. Thanks, Alan. So uh, with that, we'll go to Diego. And, and I think what Alan means is please feel free to feed into the chat the sort of question that you'd like Alan to ask when he goes there. Yeah. Yes, well, thank you. First of all, I'm very happy to, well, to hear of these three wonderful expositions and complementary among them. It was and very, which I share most of what they said. I share most of the insights. So it's very uh, stimulating to see that we are actually on many 
very important subjects on the same page, which is, I think, in this sense, is a sign of health. Anyways, going through the questions, and uh, yeah, I saw Sahili very active, you know, launching questions and also engaging in several discussions uh, during the whole session. But uh, regarding the first question, the national consultation, so that people are more aware of what, what, of what that was, was a, let's call it a low intensity referendum. And if you compare it to the big ones, such as El Esequibo, Constitutional National Assembly, et cetera, it regarded directly with the communes, with las comunas, and it had to specifically because they are can safe to be the ones who are going to execute whatever outcome the the consultation had. And I think yes, I think certainly it will have an impact. It does have an impact. Uh, it, I don't think it's that widespread, to be honest. Uh, thinking of in general terms, uh, we can talk about that afterwards, but it has to do what I said before. But yes, of course, it, it, it kind of mobilizes one of the uh, basic concerns, but also basic tenants. And even I can add rights that Venezuelan people have. And it was important because it engaged on, on yes, of course, things that need to, very basic things that need to be done in very communal areas, most of them in rural, uh, far uh, regions and areas which need, still need basic development elements such as electricity, for example, or water or uh, roads. I mean, it's as simple as that. So, but that brings another question, which is also very much in the conversation in general, which is transparency, efficiency, the struggle, the current stage of struggle against uh, corruption, which is a major issue now, which again, we can also talk about that afterwards. And yes, in a way, it also relates with uh, one of the, I think it was Katerina's question about creating a low white collar bourgeoisie in this sense, because there's, I mean, Venezuela, and this is blunt, needs money. Venezuela needs to actually create money, but also needs income because uh, most of the problems rely on trade and rely on dependency. It's historically secular uh, dependency on oil as a, a, a wealth creator. And but things have also had to change in that sense. And it touches every scope and level of the economic activity. And especially, mind you, that we are an anti-developed country, so there wasn't a thing called internal market before. There wasn't access to land in the same way. There wasn't literacy or I mean, the basics to live in order to be able to discuss things afterwards. So in that sense, many of these things lost a lot of ground during the war. And um, and it became a, a struggle of the most basic and basic fundamentals, although the fu fundamental tenets of the revolution are still there. But it also has, I mean, it has taken us in a very intense zigzag ish way to survive, spe specifically survive. And, um, and of course, it also has turned into, because it has to do with family economy, it has to do with livelihood, it has to do with many things that actually are in direct contact with the majority of the people and the ways they are able to produce uh, some sort of functional daily life within the current standards. So in that sense, it makes the, both the things, Saheli, it makes the, it, 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 play, it, it, it converged for one side, the economic issue of things and on, and on the other one, the most pressing issues, even from a, a revolutionary perspective. So yes, I don't think it's going to be that widespread because it, the phenomenon translates itself differently, and it has to do, kind of has to do with what Caterina asked, uh, and um, and how the economy it's playing a, a major role. And in this, reminds me that I forgot about saying something that thankfully, especially Steve in this case. 
uh, help me out to remind, <laughs> we have to also not forget that these are still, this must be, even regarding previous process, the, the most unjust, unfair, <laughs> uh, unequal elections we're going to have in a lot of time because of the kind of confrontation we have, because I still think, regardless of the Maragorino phenomenon, which is sadly is, to an, ex to an extent, uh, it has been Venezuela, it has been the Maduro government, the Bolivarian revolution against economy. So to wrap up these two questions, uh, it has to do also the way we have been confronted, the recent contradiction, distortions, or problems that are uh, stemming from the current situation. I'm talking about, in, in, in maybe in a sociological sense, but condition to what economy is actually doing now. And also bear in mind, and also it has to do with, the, with Katerina's questions, we are certainly very much inside the Tocqueville effect or paradox, which I, which I remind that a thing that basically says that when things have improved, the demand of things to be better uh, enhanced, but also the irritability and frustration that these current desires are not being met uh, intensifies. And, it, and I think that kind of explains a lot of what's going on in that sense. And those two questions. And yes, that also tells you how a very well thought through campaign, and I'm talking about it, Mundo Gonzalez and Maria Corina Machado strategy, which just has been a very stealthy uh, discourse as in very being very careful to not say explicitly explicitly sorry the whole thing as what they want to do what their plans are in foreign policy regarding foreign policy uh, economic just like uh, steve uh, have said but at the same time they have documentation they have written programs you can f look out for the tierra de gracia program in order to see what's actually about uh, and it would explains that they are well aware of that. I, don't, I wouldn't call it bourgeoisie, but I call it middle class, an embattled middle class that it's going to be very wooed by a prosperity, a rich, uh, a efficient future with uh, Corina Machado and Edmundo Gonzalez. So it does, it does uh, relate to that. But I don't know if at the last minute is going to be definitive uh, on the election poll. Thanks so much, uh, Diego. Uh, I think I'll go to the, in the order of the speakers. So Steve, would you like to add anything on this, on these questions, the first three questions I posed? Yeah, with regard to the question that uh, Katarina posed, with regard to a phenomenon which you know, affects progressive governments throughout Latin America, Brazil as well. As social programs succeed and lift the very poor out of the category of poverty and into the middle class, um, some becoming white collar workers, um, do their ideological orientations and their political commitments change? Um, and that, there is no question that this is a dilemma that should be discussed and faced. And I would say that part of the problem um, is due to the fact that in the case of uh, Venezuela in particular, there wasn't enough emphasis from the very beginning on uh, ideological um, discussion, on education, uh, political education. There was a lot of it. Uh, I participated in the, um, the Sucre program uh, at the high school, at the no, university level. Um, and there, there, were, there was discussion, but not, not enough of it. And there wasn't any kind of organized, with one or two exceptions, organized attempt to educate politically the rank and file of the Chavista movement. And I think that had something to do with the fact that the PSUV was considered at the outset a mass party, which had its pros and cons. Um, the problem was that you, when you create a mass party and you invite, as Chavez did, people who had voted against Chavez, Chavez said in 2007, this is a party for everybody, including the people um, who signed the petition against me 
um, for the recall election, um, that uh, that contrasts with the concept of a, of a Leninist party based on cadre who are committed to the cause and are politically educated, et cetera. Um, this was one of the shortcomings uh, of the PSUV. Um, and also the very concept of the Bolivarianismo, that uh, the concept was that this is a movement based on you know, Venezuelan style socialism. But that term was really never that well defined. I mean, there were certain aspects of it that were defined, but it wasn't really clear uh, what the revolutionary strategy, what this strategy for socialism was. Um, and as a result, I think you had uh, a situation which many of the rank and file members of the Chavista movement, when they were lifted out of poverty and became middle class, some of them ceased being revolutionary. So I think those are issues that very much has to have to be faced. Alan's um, statement about what do I do in Venezuela to cover the elections? Just one recommendation, Alan, and that is that um, everybody knows, everybody on the left knows that we have to get out of the middle class areas and go into the barrios. Uh, I'm sure that you are well aware of that. But there is another demographic which is extremely important and doesn't get emphasized enough. And that is the small towns. Because the small towns in Venezuela, in my experience, living, you know, in not in Caracas, but in Barcelona, the state of Anzuategui, is that those small towns tend to be very, very, very heavily pro-Chavista. Um, for example, Santa Fe, which is near where I live uh, in Anzuategui, between Anzuategui and Sucre. I mean, those, those people tended to be, I don't know if it's still the case, but they tended to be 90, 95% Chavista. And so in order to refute the claims that there was electoral fraud because in the middle class area, you know, 95% of the population is anti-Chavista, uh, it's important to go into those small towns and see that the reverse is the case. They tend to be very heavily pro-Chavista. I'll take care of that. <laughs> I'll make sure he goes. <laughs> Great. Uh, thanks, folks. Uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, I hope you can hear me. So, uh, and next, let me go to Ben. Ben, would you like to add anything to the questions? The Yeah. Um, I, I want to yeah. briefly address this this discussion of the Venezuelan bourgeoisie. And, and I, this is so misunderstood, and not just in Venezuela, in many formerly colonized countries in the global south. There's this kind of like ultra left idea that in order for a country to implement socialism, all you do is you have a government comes to power and it nationalizes everything and voila, magic, you have socialism. Socialism is a very complex process of construction. And if you actually understand Marxism, you understand you can't simply skip stages. And this has been the huge debate in China. And there's been a lot of misunderstanding and ultra left ultra leftist misrepresentation of China. China understood when it began the reform and opening up in 1978 that it did not have significant manufacturing capabilities, that it was largely an agricultural economy, that it was not able to escape the cycle of dependency in which the colonizing countries export high value added manufacturers to the formerly colonized countries, which might be politically, technically independent on paper, but as Nkrumah, the founding father of Ghana, famously argued, in a system of neocolonialism, there's still economic subordination in which the formerly colonized countries export low value added products, raw materials, you know, agricultural products, oil, gas, et cetera, and import those high value added goods, manufacturers in particular. So the, you have to go back, I think, in order to understand how to break out of this cycle, the state plays an absolutely fundamental role. But you also need to recognize, which China did, that as Mao famously put it, when we talk about the bourgeoisie, there are different factions of the bourgeoisie. There is the comprador bourgeoisie, which the vast majority of Venezuela's bourgeoisie consists of, but there's also a national bourgeoisie. And this these ultra leftists who say that all these all capitalists are exactly the same and that Maduro's in bed with the capitalist, this nonsense. They have this ultra leftist view. They have no idea how what it actually takes to develop a country. Do, do people really think 
that Venezuela, a hundred years from now, is its economy is going to still only be based on exporting oil. I mean, let's be real. Like Chavez, when he came to power, he inherited this problem, which is a hundred year old problem, well before Chavez was even born. And Maduro has also been trying to deal with this issue, which is that Venezuela is a petro state. Ever since oil was discovered, the vast majority of state revenue and a huge part of GDP has come simply from oil exports. This is, it's known as Dutch disease. It's known as the resource curse. This is an issue that not only Venezuela has dealt with, and it's of course very important that that oil be nationalized, publicly owned, and that the, re the rent from the ex export of oil be used to fund not only social programs, but other forms of economic activity, basic manufacturing, industrial production, so that the economy is not as dependent on simply ex importing all of the other things that it needs to run a modern economy and simply exporting oil. And how can you do that? Well, again, the state can play an important role and in and and every single successful example of every developed country on earth, the state has played a leading role, including all of the advanced capitalist countries, which had huge protectionist measures, huge tariffs, you know, import substitution industrialization policies that they implemented. They also had industrial policy. This has been shown by the economist Hajun Chang in his, his books, Bad Samaritans, in his book, Kicking Away the Ladder. Of course, this is also what China has done with uh, of course, China's system is is unique. It's a socialist system, and but it's also what even more state element uh, state oriented capitalist systems like, for instance, Japan, South Korea, Singapore. I mean, they're you know mainstream neoliberal economists would refer to them as dirigist, right? Uh, state led systems. I mean, in fact, Japan itself, when it developed in its peak years of development in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s through industrial policy. It, it was overseen through the what was called the MITI, the Ministry of International Trade and Investment, of in, uh, in investment Infrastructure, Investment, one of those. The point is, is that, that in every single case, the state has played a leading role, whether or not it's a capitalist system or in the case of China, a socialist system. So what Venezuela is clearly doing is in collaboration with China and with other countries that are trying to go through similar process is experimenting. This explains Maduro has passed, for instance, the anti-blockade law, which invites certain forms of international investment, trying to build up some manufacturing. This goes back to Chavez. In fact, under Chavez, they tried, for instance, to create phone factories. And I'm sure other people here, especially Diego, can speak more to this. The attempt to create cell phones in Venezuela, recognizing that they need to diversify their economy. This ultra leftist idea that they simply just, you know, nationalize everything and, and magic, they have socialism. It's not a scientific view. It's not a Marxist view of understanding that Venezuela, the Bolivarian Revolution, inherited this very uneven economy that was entirely reliant on exporting raw materials. And in order to get to the next stage, in order to eventually build socialism, you, you will need some forces, some market forces, and potentially even a national bourgeoisie. Now, the real contradiction, which is what China has dealt with, and China is now dealing with it very well, is how the state disciplines the national bourgeoisie, how it subordinates the interests of the national bourgeoisie to the country as a whole, and especially also how it fights against corruption, which Venezuela has been doing, which China has been doing. I mean, these are complex issues, right? But there's this idea, this ultra leftist idea that the biggest problem in Venezuela is the existence of a bourgeoisie. Well, what I think it, what actually Venezuela wants is much more of a national bourgeoisie and much less of a comprador bourgeoisie, these international capitalists who they don't produce anything. All they do is import. They have import companies that import from the US and wherever. They don't contribute anything to the productive economy. That's a much more real problem. So I really, I think we should, we should really need to move away from this ultra leftist idea that anything that, that, that has to do with a manufacturing or a market or production is inherently capitalist. And if it's not directly being done by the state, 
because it's not a Marxist view. You can't simply skip stages to an agricultural economy, to socialism, or from a, a petro state directly to socialism. It's a complex process. The most important thing is that the that the PSUV, that the Bolivarian Revolution, that the socialist forces maintain in control of the state firmly and have the power to discipline the national bourgeoisie. If they lose that power and the national bourgeoisie is able to actually determine the direction of the state, then that's the real problem. In China, they've been able to prevent that. And I think Venezuela is going through a process of maintaining that discipline, but also trying to diversify its economy. It's very, it's very complicated, it's very hard, but if the PSUV and Maduro lose power, it's over. I mean, there absolutely is no so-called left alternative. It's childish, it's infantile. And if, I mean, the, these forces that claim to be to the left of Maduro, if they were magically somehow able to come to power through, I, I mean, again, it's ultra leftism, it's infantile, but if they were magically somehow able to come to power, their government would Im almost immediately fall. I mean, so we have to be realistic here. And social, and I really invite people again to, to study actually existing socialism and what other actually existing con socialist countries are doing, not what go governments tried to do in the past and that ultimately failed. This, this, this purism, purity fetish, we really need to be more realistic. And I think Venezuela is doing that. Maduro and many of the advisors around him are doing that. And that's why I, I think I'm pretty optimistic that, I mean, that it's going to be difficult. But as Diego said, they've gone through the most difficult period, I think, of the brutal hyperinflation caused by the blockade, the brutal U.S. economic war, the never ending coup attempts. And now it's not as sexy, but now is the, the process of simply trying to economically develop. Uh, thank you so much, Ben. That was so well put. Um, uh, last round in this question is uh, goes to uh, Alan. Alan, would you like to add anything? Um, no, I think Ben, uh, Diego, and Steve all shared some really good insights there, and I would probably just be repeating a lot of the same points. Plus, I've been looking at the chat and uh, getting distracted about all their suggestions. Yes, uh, I, I can see Venezuela as well. Well, your call has yielded a lot of good suggestions. I hope they are very useful. I actually think that uh, uh, the, uh, among the questions that have already been put, I know, Nino, you had a question that seemed was relevant, but I think probably Ben has answered that question. But if you want to follow it up, please raise your hand through the ch uh, raise hand function. And that also goes for anyone else who has any final round of questions, because we are coming close to the two hour mark and we generally don't like to go over that. In fact, we like to keep well under that. So unless there are any urgent questions that somebody wants to put, uh, we should bring this uh, excellent discussion to a close. But Nino, did you have anything to say? Would you like to add anything? No. OK. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to raise uh, any remaining questions? Uh, people have shared excellent resources in the chat, uh, and I think everybody should be able to copy the chat for themselves. Um, and can, if can, can I no... ask? Yes, is, of course, it, is it permissible? Can I ask Ashley, Diego, and, and maybe Steve as well? Sorry, Alan, I mean, all love to you, but just because of their expertise, maybe um, Diego, can you talk about the attempts that we've seen um, in the recent years with the anti-blockade law and others to diversify the economy away from oil. I know this has been a huge topic and I'm very curious what, what I've heard that there's been good progress. For instance, in 2019, I saw that about 60% of food was still imported. And now I think it's, it's the opposite. I think now 60% is produced locally and 40% is imported. So that's an important step toward food, food sovereignty. I'm wondering if there's been other parts of diversification of the economy. Uh, so sure. I'll go Diego and then Steve and anyone else, and finally anyone else who might want to add anything. But go ahead, Diego. Thank you. Sure. I mean, it's a it's a key question. It's not enoughly developed in general. I mean, we from a, from a, I don't know if the more 
thoroughly responsible perspective if you check out what has been written <clears throat> around. We tried in the Admission Verdad to do our best <clears throat> regarding that case. Uh, there are many in Spanish, I'm sorry, I, they haven't been translated yet, but although Orinoco Tribune has meant some of them. Uh, but um, yes, the thing about, we had, we have had very important diversifying initiatives and drives too. Bear in mind that these are also being uh, done after they beat us so hard that we were with it and try to make sure that we're not able to recover ourselves on many fronts, especially, of course, we already, that you, you already talked about it in on the oil dependency one, but also on trade in general. Still, uh, there are many, yeah, that, that you, you uh, Ben, you talked about the food uh, aspect. And yes, this is very important. If you take, I think we all, you are all aware of the CLAP program, uh, which is a, a very uh, well-organized, uh, cheap way to access to foods, to basic some staple foods, and which are very important, a very important part of the Venezuelan diet, such as uh, corn flour, pasta, which we eat a lot of here also, and some other things, canned goods, sometimes cooking oil, sugar, uh, powdered milk, whatnot. And actually, Ben, it was even higher. We just, we're going to publish something about this soon. Uh, but uh, it was even higher, the, the percentage of foreign produced and processed uh, food uh, back in, in 2017 was actually around 90%, 92%, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, most of the products were Mexican, Brazilian, even Guyanese uh, and Turkish <laughs> afterwards that uh, became part of the club uh, bag. But this was started um, changing, especially after, I think during yeah, 2019 on, uh, and the percentage was actually inverted, just as they just said. I mean, especially with well, corn flour uh, being one of the most important ones. And also uh, on a small agricultural level, on a small diet uh, level and access to uh, it has always been the case, even during the worst part of the sanctions, we had access to, I mean, for example, I don't know, plant uh, some vegetables and grain that were already produced in Venezuela. So in that sense, that was never out and it was very important. Then things started to change. And yes, for example, agro industry had a very important boost of a, and also support from many countries such as China, Russia, South Africa on, on the whole production change of value process. And you also have, because I actually worked uh, until February or March on a very strong, heavy rural area on conflict resolution, by the way, in the Barina state, and which is a major cattle uh, producer state, one of the most important uh, on the supply of meat nationally we have issues in in, in, in exp export and imports i mean and how to import meat that's another whole other discussion but um and that's also that something that uh it has seen a very important uh strengthening also think about other aspects that's regarding the food one but also think about yes the as things for the last two three years uh the tax revenue has been higher than the oil one that's another very important element because a lot of the yes yeah, service commerce uh, area has been highly uh, enhanced also recently and, and also regarding exports and it was a highly pragmatical move but a very necessary one it also had to do with currency and currency flows now inside the inside venezuela proper which actually allowed it i mean they all the control laws were actually uh, cast aside and um, they allowed, uh, yeah, I think in, you know, in a sense, it could seem very, a very monetary uh, orthodox move, but it wasn't, but it could easily be seen as one in the, in the monetary mass and how the, the, the flow of other foreign currencies actually uh, helped uh, de-choke 
the economy on several levels. And I'm not talking only about dollar. I mean, we have time also talking about euro. And in some cases, rubles, Turkish lira, and yuan. This is not de-dollarization whatsoever. It kind of gets close, and we have very uh, several experiments on that front. But it, of course, it's not that. And in that sense, Venezuela, it is a, a una menaza, an unusual and uh, extraordinary threat to the U.S. and the rule-based order. Uh, but um, and the other thing that uh, regarding the the dive, mild or shy uh, successful because I'm, when I'm talking about shy, I'm not talking about because there have been many many initiatives of diversification. Yeah, you have uh, like small industries start, starting to run up again, like pharmaceuticals. Venezuela had an industrial base for pharmaceuticals, very small one, but existent nonetheless. And also in some other things like spare parts. And there's also a lot of ingenuity going on, especially uh, with the uh, CPT, the, the workers uh, committees blocks. Or I've, I've forgot the, I'm not going to translate, it's easy to find anyway, in building spare parts for the industries, for basic industries, such as silor, so the steel industry, the iron industry, and, and whatnot. And yes, also you can think about we are in, in foreign trade. You can also think about a a primarization of commodities in general, uh, uh, which is uh, thank you, Francisco. Yeah, workers' production committees. That's it. Uh, that also has have, has seen a very important uh, opening in the last years, which also contribute to this diversification. I insist that it's still pretty mild. And also I insist that their effects in life are not that easily easily to perceive. I mean, for common people, sometimes they all this uh, expositions and charts that the government shows about the recovery, which are absolutely true. I mean, this is not bias in any by any metric. Uh, Sometimes they don't just don't translate themselves enough for the population because of the, what I said before, because about the salary thing and the local currency thing. And um, and also, yeah, I think, and we have to address this to uh, the whole PDVSA crypto scheme of corruption, which was a massive uh, conspirational, disgusting, miserable uh Plot by a very well-known methodical asshole, and now I'm finally happy to call him that way because I've still, that's what I thought of him a long time ago. I'm talking about Tarek El Aysami and his cronies, which basically also had a very hard impact uh, on the recovery of the salary and the value of money in Venezuela, the of Bolivar as a currency. So it, you all, so that also like evinces. One of the, at the same time, one of the symptoms of recovery, and of course, the symptoms of distortions that you can also perceive in uh, the measures that Venezuela had to take, none of them nice, I guess, because we're also fighting with the one hand, with another one, with the other one tied to our back, uh, a very, the most corrupt element of all this, which is sanctions itself and foreign intervention, of course, and also, uh, Vendepatrias in general, and I don't think I have to translate what Vendepatria means, uh, which is part of that Comprador Elidias. And, um, but uh, you can also say, as Ben talked about, the role the state has had in uh, curtail and address and attack and do their best in many instances to roll up these corruption schemes that have been happening ever since. This is also a secular problem. This is not a Bolivarian revolution one, although it has had their own features, which are also uh, quite dangerous in any way, especially now talking about one more time about aspirate, economic aspirations and also uh, another side effect of the, especially the old commerce opening side of things, which is easy money. Uh, rentier money, but um, and very it could also be misleading about what some individual would actually want at this stage of life and could believe. And this also one more time relates to 
Caterina's uh, question earlier uh, about the that white color bourgeoisie. Yeah, of course I do. It's a white color, or not, not necessarily even white. It could be like, I don't know, a brownish as in it's close to dirt, but also to the white to the high tier, to, to the to the fat cat colored people. Um so so I think that's kind of addresses the that part of the of the of Ben's questions. And I think, and I have to jump in and add one thing because there was another question around about securing information uh, in our media landscape. It's, yeah, um, I don't know. Yeah, there are very me uh, measures and then sometimes heavy handed measures that have been taken. Of course, they, they're not usually good PR uh, on some uh, areas such as, you know, blockading some websites or whatnot that have, of course, they're not that successful in general. I mean, not even myself uh, <laughs> uh, follow it if you need to actually uh, go check any of those uh, resources that are around. But, and also mind you that it all runs mostly on the social media landscape, which is a very, it's a whole different ball game of what we were used to here in the media landscape. I don't think the media in general are have the same place they used to have, and you can compare that too well to the 2.0, 3.0 discussion that daily goes on and how it actually stimulates and reaches other elements of perception, even more immediatist and faster and more aggressive and more emotional above all, and also very more very well able to. Uh, uh, turn the screws on various specific acts of well studies aspects of the human mind and soul in this case. So it, uh, it's a very different ball game. It's really hard to to confront, and we have not been the best in general historically on the communication fronts in general. And I think we haven't succeeded that much either uh, at this point. This is an autocritical observation, of course. I'm not. Uh, putting myself outside of that problem because I uh, work on media, I work on a uh, public analysis, I work on, an, on a uh, research, investigative uh, analytic uh, website. So that kind of also touches that also that question that was like left a bit unanswered. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Diego. Steve, I think we have time for any intervention that you have to make. But after that, I will have to bring this to a close. So go ahead, Steve. Okay, I'll, I'll keep it brief. Uh, with regard to uh, Ben's question and also his comments, um, I think the epicenter of the alliance between the Chavista government uh, and the so-called national bourgeoisie uh, is the countryside, is agricultural sector. And the champion of that alliance uh, more than any other leader is the Minister of Agriculture, Wilmer Castro Soteldo, uh, who participated in one of the 1992 coup attempts uh, um, against the government of Carlos Andres Perez. And as Minister of Agriculture, he, he, I think, is the only Chavista leader that I know of who uses the term revolutionary bourgeoisie. Uh, but this is aligned with what Ben was saying about the fact that the bourgeoisie um, consists of different sectors and they can't be all lumped into one sector that is characterized or uh, described as the enemy, as the adversary, uh, because it's much more complex. Uh, ben used the term disciplining the national bourgeoisie. Um, I think that's an appropriate term. And another term that, that I use is the strategic alliance as opposed to a tactical alliance. And I think that is a distinction that has to be made between the strategy of the 20th century, much of the 20th century, at least up until the age of globalization in the 80s, of a, a strategic alliance in which there is a bourgeoisie uh, that plays a fairly stable role in terms of uh, a new stage, which is an anti-imperialist, but not necessarily socialist stage. Um, that concept of a strategic alliance, I think, has to be replaced, at least on the basis of the 
the Venezuelan experience and the experience of other progressive governments in Latin America, specifically uh, Bolivia and Brazil, I think the alliance is more of a tactical alliance. Um, and specifically in the case of Sol Castro Soteldo, uh, you've got to consider the tensions there uh, between that agricultural bourgeoisie uh, and another project of the Chavista movement, which is the communes, uh, the communes, which in the countryside have land claims, which clash with that agricultural bourgeoisie. So it's a complicated kind of situation. Uh, and um, I think that the experience of Venezuela has to be analyzed. And I agree with Ben that the ultra leftist view that, you know, the bourgeoisie is the enemy and nationalization is the, is the panacea, I think has to be replaced with a cold objective uh, analysis of what's taking place in this case in the countryside of, of Venezuela. Uh, thank you so much, uh, um, Steve. Um, I'm um, we are going to bring this to a close. But before we do that, I have two people I'd like to ask to make very brief uh, uh, announcements. The first is Alison Bodine. Um, um, uh, Linda, would you mind asking Alison to unmute? And uh, then, Alison, could you make your announcement about what you put in the chat about the um, Venezuela Solidarity Network. Uh, please keep it brief. Sounds good. Hi, everyone. Thank you to Orinoco Tribune and to the International Manifesto Group. I just put in the chat announcement an appeal to everyone to join the Venezuela Solidarity Network's monthly webinar online picket. Uh, it's going to be Tuesday, July 23rd at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern to continue these important discussions on the election and also a general appeal to people to join the Venezuela Solidarity Network. It is a newly formed organization of groups across Canada and the United States and one of the co-sponsors of uh, this series of webinars and there's a link in the chat at venezuelasolidaritynetwork.org uh, that you can join. So greetings and thanks from Fire This Time Movement for Social Justice and the Venezuela Solidarity Network. Uh, thanks, Alison. And those of you who don't know, the Fire This Time and Alison and her colleagues, they do fantastic work on Venezuela in North America. So please join them. I have once again shared their link. Uh, in the chat when Alison also has. So if you want to save the chat, you will find it there. And now I would like Alan Freeman to make a brief announcement. Just to emphasize, um, I think that what Alison Badin and what the network has been doing is formidably important because we're not just here to comment, we're here to support. And solidarity is an absolutely critical element of particularly given the attempt to isolate the regime of what is needed. In that respect, I want to say that we are very pleased at the collaboration between the Manifesto Group and the Orinoco Tribune because it's the beginning of a very necessary element of solidarity, which is dialogue between people who are at the heart of the process itself and people who are trying to solidarize with it. So we hope to continue and I want to invite everybody here to join in that <clears throat> process. And we aim, uh, oh, among the ideas under discussion is that we will have a webinar after the election on its international significance and consequences. So I'm just pre-announcing that even though it's still just a glint in our eye and we're discussing it and invite anybody and everybody who wants to um, you know join this uh, increasing collaboration uh, between organizations who want to get out the truth mm -hmm. and who want to organize solidarity to, to contact us via the addresses that you've all seen okay and very brief less than two minute um, uh, uh, opening for Diego because he would very much like to add something on the land issue so Diego please keep it brief but please go ahead Sure, thank you. Uh, here's the thing, uh, I, I saw, I mean, Steve said something that's quite important about the land issue and uh, the contradictions that are going on in Venezuela right now. I, have, I hope we keep this conversation, I, I don't mind if it's right afterwards, the, the end of the webinar, but it's even more complex and dynamic than that. <clears throat> and, and this is, I can say it's an informed opinion that the last four years I've uh, been going through rural areas, especially in Western Venezuela, uh, and um, it's not, uh, the thing about Castro Sotelo, it's, I mean, he did, did an important boost on agro-industry, 
But on the land uh, owning issue, it's not, it, it's, I mean, it, it has gone through so much advance, uh, advances and it has gone into a new territory of contradictions because of sometimes even uh, you have the situation of even land without campesinos and no one working or even uh, the, the, the unableness to actually develop it fully because of, not, of the lack of resources to do so. So that's actually the most pressing issue in the El Campo is regarding small and big and mid and even big uh, land uh, workers and uh, landowners and agriculture projects in general. And it goes even uh, not at the same pace as the, as the agro-industrial side of things has. So even it, it's a very, even deeper discussion that well for another time, but it's a very contradictory one also. It's very disturbing at some points. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Diego. And I think that uh, what Diego says is quite important. And who knows, maybe we will manage to organize something specifically on the land issue in Venezuela and more widely, I think, in Latin America, where it is a very big issue. So, uh, and, and a very complex issue, I think, as Diego says, it's not just a question of land reform or anything. It has to go deeper than that. So, on that note, though, I think this has been a wonderfully rich conversation. Thanks to all the speakers, uh, Alan, Steve, Ben, Diego, thank you very much. Thanks to all the co-sponsors um, uh, who have been, who have helped us to publicize this. Uh, I would also request the co-sponsors to make sure that the video of this is further publicized because it can also be watched after the event. So please help us in doing that. And uh, and thanks to all who have stayed. We still have nearly 50 people here uh, after, after the two, two plus hour um, two hour plus uh, mark. So uh, I think this really shows that the, this is a subject that uh, inspires a lot of people. So thank you very much, and uh, uh, we will be we we will be probably we will be taking a break during August. But the International Manifesto Group will be back with its webinars in September. So please watch out for our notifications. Thank you very much. And by the way, please check us out at www.internationalmanifesto.org. Read our manifesto, consider signing it, consider volunteering, consider donating, all those things. Thank you very much and goodbye.